California's wildfires could end up costing PGE part of its company. How the utility is looking for a way to cover billions of dollars in potential claims. Sacramento gets ready for an inauguration. See the work that's being done ahead of this weekend ceremonies for Governor-elect Gavin Newsom. So you don't need congressional approval to build the no, wall? No, we can use them. Absolutely. We can call a national emergency because of the security of our country. No end in sight for the government shutdown. Now President Trump says he might try to build a new border wall without the approval of Congress. They're looking for creative pursuits. They're looking for continuing education. They're looking for um, to get involved in things. And how a local museum is using photography to help hundreds of local seniors stimulate their minds. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. President Trump says he might declare a national emergency to build a border wall without approval from Congress. During a press conference at the White House today, the president claimed he has executive power to act unilaterally. The wall remains a sticking point in the government shutdown that's about to enter its third week. Uh, have you considered using emergency powers to grant yourself authorities to build this wall without congressional approval. And second, yes, on I Mexico, have. you have. Yes, I have. And, and I can do it if I want. So you don't need congressional approval to build the no, wall? No, we can use them. Absolutely. We can call a national emergency because of the security of our country. Absolutely. No, we can do it. I haven't done it. I may do it. I may do it. But we can call a national emergency and build it very quickly. And uh, it's another way of doing it. But if we can do it through a negotiated process, we're giving that a shot. So is that uh, a threat hanging over the Democrats? I never threaten anybody. But, but I am allowed to do that, yes. Party leaders will meet with Vice President Mike Pence over the weekend to try to work out an agreement. The House passed a bill last night that would reopen the government without money for a new wall. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell won't allow a vote because the president doesn't support it. Mexico's foreign minister is asking the U.S. to investigate two recent tear gas incidents at the border, citing Mexico's commitment to human rights. KPBS reporter Jean Guerrero says immigration attorneys in San Diego and Tijuana agree the U.S. should investigate. U.S. immigration agencies say the use of force on a group of more than 100 migrants trying to enter the U.S. illegally was necessary because people were throwing rocks at Border Patrol agents. But witnesses, including journalists, say nothing was thrown into the U.S. until authorities launched tear gas. Immigration attorney Erica Pinedo of Al Otro Lado says the U.S. government's use of tear gas against families was unlawful and unnecessary. Launching a chemical weapon into another country without provocation um, could be seen by some as an act of war. Um, it's certainly disrespectful. Customs and Border Protection has told KPBS that officials can't answer questions for now because of the government shutdown. Immigration attorneys say extreme left-wing groups are aggravating the situation by encouraging migrants from the caravan to jump the fence using flyers and false information. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. This just into our newsroom. The city of San Diego may have a new temporary shelter to help migrants at the border. On Twitter today, Mayor Kevin Faulkner shared this letter to the state's Office of Emergency Services. City staff says the Camp Barrett, Barrett Youth Correctional Facility in Alpine could meet the needs of a shelter. They say the state could lease the property. The goal is to help migrants who made it through federal processing at the border. Prosecutors in Tijuana say three men are being held in connection with the murder of two San Diego teenagers. Juan Suarez Ojeda and Christopher Gomez went to Ensenada in November. Before returning to San Diego, they and a friend were beaten and killed in an apartment in Tijuana. Gomez was a senior at O'Farrell Charter High School in Encanto. Suarez Ojeda was a recent graduate of Ingenuity Charter School. 
The founder of a company that offered a controversial diabetes procedure clinic across the nation, including here in San Diego, has pleaded guilty in a public corruption case. iNews source reporter Megan Wood has details. G. Ford Gilbert, a California lawyer who started Trina Health, pleaded guilty Friday in Alabama to conspiring to bribe Alabama's former House Majority Leader Mickey Hammond. Gilbert's goal was to get legislation passed to force Blue Cross Blue Shield to pay for the Trina diabetes procedure at Alabama clinics. iNewsource spent months investigating Gilbert before his indictment in April. He claimed the Trina insulin infusions could reverse diabetes complications. Here's Gilbert talking about his success in 2018. Any person who truly understands what we do is wildly impressed and enamored with the outcomes we achieve. We've never had somebody who is part of our treatment who walks away and says, oh, well, that doesn't work. But experts I knew source spoke to disagreed. The procedure was called a scam and insurance companies refused to cover it. Gilbert now faces a maximum sentence of five years in prison and a fine up to $250,000. For KPBS, I'm I knew source reporter Megan Wood. Join us at the roundtable as we look into the clash between migrants and the Border Patrol. We try to puzzle out the costly malware attack on the Union Tribune and other newspapers and ask whether Southern California Edison's disposal of San Onofre's nuclear waste is safe. All that and more tonight at 830. A strong jobs report helped stocks gain about 3% today. The Labor Department says 312,000 jobs were added in December. The national unemployment rate increased slightly to 3.9%. Experts say that's due to more people entering the job market. Another major story on Wall Street this week involves what used to be recently a trillion dollar company. I talked about the troubles for Apple in some of this week's other business news with SDSU marketing lecturer Mira Kopik. So, Miro, today the Dow is up several hundred points, and this is after taking a serious tumble yesterday following the lower than expected sales coming from Apple, particularly in the China market. What can you tell us about this roller coaster ride? Well, Happy New Year, Ebony. Happy New Year. Um, it, it is um, part of the whole volatility that, and we'll talk about that more later about the, the market. But Apple yesterday made a pretty major announcement at, at missing their forecast. This is the first forecast they've missed in 15 years, and they missed it by over 8%. So this is a big shock to the market. When, when a company that was worth a trillion dollars just a couple of months ago has already lost 30% of their, its value, so $300 billion from October to, to yesterday's decline, that's a major issue. And the driver for all of this is the fact that in the Chinese market, the market has slowed considerably. There's a lot of price competition. Apple had a 12 share in 2015. Today they have an eight share. The market's grown, but they haven't kept pace because local competitors like Huawei are really offering a much less expensive phone. And that also is f filtering into the United States. You know, the average price of an Apple iPhone X is over $1,000. The XR is $749. That's the price of a computer. Right. And if people are replacing their computers every couple of years, they're taking pause to think it over again. And speaking of Apple, let's take a listen to CEO Tim Cook's explanation about the lower than expected sales. As we look at what's going on in China, the, it's clear that the economy began to slow there for the second half. And what I believe to be the case is the trade tensions between the United States and China put additional pressure on their economy. And so we saw as the quarter went on, a, things like uh, traffic in our retail stores, traffic in our channel partner stores, uh, the reports of the smartphone industry uh, contracting, uh, particularly bad in November. I haven't seen the December number yet, but I would, I would guess that that would not be good either. So we heard there the, the numbers are not expected to be good. Um, will this possibly impact the recent news that Apple plans to expand in a number of cities, including right here in San Diego? Well, I think uh, the, the expansion in San Diego is for um, high-end jobs, developers, uh, engineers. That's not going to change. I think the bigger issue for Apple is going to be um, the, um, the price of these phones. They're now an iPhone company. What the report didn't show is that every other division of Apple did extraordinarily well. 
but when you're so dependent on these iPhone sales, if people aren't coming into the stores or you need bigger incentives, that's something that Apple's going to have to plan for in 2019. So moving on to another U.S.-based company that's experiencing a drop in stocks, Tesla. It seems that investors are possibly responding to the federal tax break, which will be phased out. Is there any sign that maybe the popularity of this car is dying out? I would I would say that you know Teslas are going to be as popular as ever. The the issue is Tesla actually uh, had a two thousand dollar price increase across its entire line, anticipating the federal tax credit that you mentioned going from seventy five hundred dollars that people can take off directly from their taxes to half this year three thousand seven hundred fifty, and it's phased out at the end of the year. Tesla's really working hard to try to keep the price accessible. You know, one thing they could talk about their popularity is that over 400,000 people, when the Model 3 was announced, put a non-refundable $1,000 deposit waiting in line for that production to come out and, and allow them to buy that car. And that's the bigger issue for Tesla. It's not popularity of the car, but their ability to produce the cars that are in demand. Moving on, lastly, we are entering the second week of the partial <clears throat> government shutdown. Um, from a financial perspective, who's impacted? Well, you know, 800,000 federal employees are impacted. Um, half of them are at home without a paycheck. The other are working with a paycheck or without a paycheck, uh, but they have to work. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, for example. If there is not a agreement today, um, nine of 15 federal departments are shutting down at the end of the day, which is a major issue. And economists project that for every two weeks that the government is shut down, we lose a tenth of a point of GDP growth. So if we were projecting 3% growth, for 2019, that would be 2.9% as of today. And if the shutdown goes on two more weeks, it's going to be 2.8%. So it's very important that while it doesn't have humongous impact, it's big impact. We'll stop right there. Mira Kopik, thank you so much for helping us make sense of it. Until next time. Thank you, Ebony. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, congressional leaders finish another meeting at the White House with no sign of an end to the government shutdown. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. NPR reports California's largest utility might sell part of its company to cover future wildfire claims. Fire investigators are looking into whether PG&E equipment played a role in last year's campfire, which is the deadliest in state history. A senior company official told NPR that PG&E might sell its natural gas division. The utility could face claims in the billions of dollars if proven liable for the fire. Makers of the official Weather Channel app are being sued for misusing and selling user data. The city of Los Angeles filed a lawsuit today claiming the company used deceptive practices to track user locations and provide it to marketers. While the app uses the Weather Channel's branding, it's actually made by a company owned by IBM. An estimated 45 million people use the app each and every month. If you rent a scooter or buy a car in 2019, there are a couple of laws you should know about. Capital Public Radio's Randall White explains some of the changes. Adults no longer legally need to wear bicycle helmets when riding motorized scooters. It's part of a new law that also changes which roads these scooters can access. Cities and counties can now choose to allow them on roads with speed limits up to 35 miles an hour. But the law limits motor scooters on highways with speed limits above 25 miles an hour unless there's an established bike path. Also new this year, California auto dealers need to attach temporary paper license plates to all new and used vehicles at the point of sale. The intent of the law is to reduce the number of people who skip paying tolls, but it's also expected to help with some law enforcement activities. In Sacramento, I'm Randall White. Well, we got some sunshine across Southern California here today, but still going to watch cloud cover increase as we have moisture sliding in from the northwest. So that's something to keep in mind for your extended forecast. Potential for some showers to peak on through as well as some mountain snow showers out towards Mount Laguna. Now tonight, once again, increasing clouds with a low of 51. We continue across the region here. 37 in Borrego Springs, 35 in Mount Laguna and 42 in Oceanside. Everywhere in San Diego County noticing uh, that cloud cover building on up and that's because we're getting 
moisture rolling on in. Rain will continue to arrive from the northwest here. Some snow out towards uh, the mountains there. Rain in towards San Francisco. And then we'll see some showers once again extend themselves in towards Los Angeles and here in San Diego. We're also talking moisture also coming from the south. Some subtropical moisture that's going to uh, help with some wet weather into your extended forecast. Now, we start off your day dry in Borrego Springs. A few clouds out there, high of 62. 61 in Oceanside and 62 in San Diego. 46 in Mount Laguna for your Saturday. Not a bad kickoff to Saturday, but as we continue through your Saturday uh, night, that's when you notice the showers and the potential for some mountain showers uh, in towards Mount Laguna picking on up. Rain also going to be likely to be seen for the midweek. Early week will remain dry here. So for Saturday, partial sunshine near the coast, the high of 61, remaining in the lower 60s for Sunday, but with a better chance for that rain to be more noticeable Sunday morning. That begins to taper on off. We return to a dry pattern Monday and Tuesday before we get another chance of wet weather by midweek. The same goes for inland areas in the 60s through this weekend. Wet conditions for your Sunday morning, drying out for early week and seeing temperatures rise into the lower 70s by Tuesday. Mountain areas, well, you'll also be looking at some showers around. Once again, some snow showers in those higher elevations. Snow levels are really high, about 5,000 feet. Uh, but you will still see a few flakes. Don't worry, nothing accumulating. We'll also see wet conditions in towards the deserts for your Sunday morning, drying out into your Monday. Reporting for KPBS News, I'm your AccuWeather meteorologist, Dodgy Aswad. Back to you. Monday brings a new era for California as Governor-elect Gavin Newsom is sworn into office. Inaugural events are planned throughout the weekend in Sacramento. Newsom will attend a special gala Sunday night headlined by Pitbull. The event will raise money for fire victims. The inauguration is set for Monday at noon on the steps of the state capitol. It's a great festive occasion with lots of pageantry, lots of formality, lots of ceremony. But I think it's still important in this kind of modern era to have this ceremony and pageantry because it really signals the beginning of a new era. It really is our kind of formal way of saying out with the old and in with the new. If the weather cooperates on Monday, you can expect to see um, all, a lot, thousands of supporters in town, lots of parties. You know, the inauguration really is one of those days where everybody sets aside politics and cherishes, you know, what makes us a great state and cherishes our democracy. KPBS Radio will have special live coverage of Gavin Newsom's inauguration. It begins Monday morning at 11 a.m. As baby boomers get older, educators are finding new ways to keep their minds sharp. KPBS education reporter Megan Burks looks at how the Museum of Photographic Arts is teaching this aging population. In Balboa Park, people point their cameras and smartphones at the beautiful scroll work and reliefs along the Prado. Not unusual, but these amateur photographers are part of a special program called SEPIA. SEPIA is an acronym. SEPIA stands for Seniors Exploring Photography, Identity and Appreciation. Uh, and it's an outreach initiative here at the museum uh, where we engage older adults and seniors through uh, four-week courses, through art talks, and through interactive museum tours. Each course takes on a different theme. This one is called On Location. We're exploring architecture in Balboa Park. Then we're exploring form and color in uh, Chicano Park. How many of you, it's your first time here to Chicano Park? Wow, so over half of the class, it seems like. So I'm really excited that we're all here to explore today. They're exploring color through the rich murals activists painted on the underbelly of the Coronado Bridge in the 1970s. Sherry Anderson is drawn in by a painting of an eagle atop a field of vibrant yellow. I don't really know anything about the equipment. I have a little point and shoot, but I do have a design background, and so I know about composition and form and all the art, artistic parts, and so I just try to get something pleasing in my frame and hope for the best. Anderson says she turned to sepia after retiring from her interior design business. I mean, I can do this without all the business pressure. There's a lot of, of business and psychology that goes into design, which is very interesting when you're young, but it gets more wearing as you get older. 
And so this is fun to just be able to do the pure creative part and not have to worry about keeping the business going, keeping the clients happy. All I have to do is make myself happy. Despite her retirement, Anderson still has a job to do. She's a caregiver for her adult daughter who has a disability. When you're caregiving, you create beauty in a certain way, but I really want something tangible too. After printing their best shots, students discuss their work. I like this one because I'm really fascinated by the juxtaposition between the color and the concrete. And that really mm -hmm. speaks to the neighborhood too, right? Because the neighborhood was always a vibrant place. Um, and then when the highway went in in the 1960s, you can imagine if somebody suddenly in you know, Balboa Park just dug up the Prado. Program manager Kevin Lindy says this kind of engagement later in life is linked to better mental and physical health, and it's something the museum hopes to expand. It currently reaches more than 700 students annually. We have this increasing population uh, of older adults and seniors as part of the baby boomer population, uh, and they're, they're redefining what it means to, to age. Um, and so they're looking for creative pursuits, they're looking for continuing education, they're looking for um, to get involved in things. That it creates a t totally different perspective on your life. It makes you realize how much there is out there in the wide world. It helps you forget politics for a while. I mean, when you're just immersed in creativity and beauty, you don't have to think about all the rest of life that maybe isn't quite so beautiful. I, I would recommend it to anybody who wants a little stimulation and a change in their life. Megan Burks, KPBS News. MOPA runs a separate program for people with dementia and their caregivers. We have more information on our website, kpbs.org. Hearing the Future is an annual music festival put on by the San Diego Symphony. KPBS arts editor Nina Guerin talked with the symphony's CEO about this year's event. Please tell us about the Hearing the Future festival. In 2019, the San Diego Symphony, along with 13 other institutions, is presenting a festival called Hearing the Future, which is somewhat of a provocative title. Um, and it was really intended to, as I like to think about it, to kind of examine the blank canvas, the blank manuscript page before the notes are put on. And what is genius? What is creativity? And looking at it through that lens, a wide range of music from jazz to classical to chamber music, um, through also to young playwrights and dancers, because it has to start somewhere. Hearing the future also means that many composers today or writers today are reflecting to us their view of this fast-paced changing world and reflecting things that really matter to them. And so it really is about how do we look forward from our present tense and what is the future going to sound like? So from the title, you would think that you're really focusing on new music, but it's, that's not the case, right? You're also kind of looking back as well. It, it's looking back at a moment and then looking forward. So 1830, three 25-year-old composers writing in the same year, Mendelssohn, Liszt, and Berlioz, all breaking the rules. And then you fast forward to 2018, uh, and look at compositions from this time through a different lens because we, we don't know how those composers or writers are going to be viewed from the future, but we can look at what they're trying to say today. And so every January now for the past four years, right. you've had this festival. How important has it become to the San Diego Symphony Orchestra? I think this festival is an important moment in the year for the San Diego Symphony because it allows us to collaborate deeply with other institutions, and it allows us to welcome a variety of audiences. In, in, we're in 11 locations, this festival, uh, during the course of three weeks. So it really is an opportunity to kind of spread out and uh, reach people where they are. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts of the festival. Also, because we can have multiple performances in a day, and you can really sample this festival 
throughout three weeks and immerse yourself. And for me, I'm, I like to think of myself as a curious person, but I know our audiences are really hungry for that kind of context and content. And so we really try to focus on this, these various works that have commonality and also very different. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time with us today. It's my pleasure. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. One here, go make something of your own. Not a mosquito, are you bothering me? Not a mosquito, are you bothering me? Not a mosquito, why can't you leave me alone? 